In 319 BC, the former regent of the empire, Antipater, would die. Upon his death, he transferred regency to the hands of his lieutenant, Polyperchon, as opposed to his own son, Cassander. Cassander would reject his father's decision, and the two soon fell into civil war. The war quickly spread amongst the successors. Polyperchon allied with Eumenes against Cassander and Antagonus. Eumenes, who had been held up in the fort of Nora, had been in negotiations with Antipater. But once the news of his death and the subsequent civil war reached him, he managed to slip away. Marching through his former satrap of Cappadocia, he managed to recruit a small army before marching to the royal treasury in Cilicia, where he would use its funds to recruit mercenaries. He also secured the loyalty of 6,000 of Alexander's veterans who were stationed in the province. In the spring of 317 BC, he marched his army to Phoenicia and raised a naval force on behalf of Polyperchon. Back in Asia, at the start of 318 BC, Arhidius, the governor of Hellespontine Phrygia, tried to take the city of Cyzicus. Antagonus, as a stratios of Asia, took this as a challenge to his authority and sent an army against Arhidius, while he himself marched with his main army into Lydia against its governor Clytus, whom he subsequently drove from the province securing him a strong foothold in Anatolia. Clytus fled to Macedon and joined Polyperchon, who was marching his army south in an attempt to force the Greek cities to side with him against Cassander and Antagonus. Although Polyperchon was initially successful in securing control of the Greek cities, he suffered a major setback at Megapolis. A few months later, the fleet Eumenes had raised for him was decisively defeated by Antagonus at the Battle of Byzantium. Cassander, who now had undisputed naval dominance and was leading his own campaign, managed to secure control of Athens. Shortly thereafter, Polyperchon was forced to give up his Greek campaign and was subsequently driven from Macedon by Cassander. Polyperchon fled to Epirus, where he joined Alexander's mother, Olympias, widow Roxanne, and infant child, Alexander IV. He formed an alliance with King Acides of Epirus and Olympias. The latter then led an army into Macedon. She was initially successful, defeating one of Cassandra's armies, which was under the leadership of the disabled King Philip, whom she subsequently had murdered. But soon, Cassander returned from the Peloponnese and defeated and executed her in 316, taking Roxana and the boy king into his custody. Meanwhile, Antagonus had consolidated his newly conquered satraps and now marched against Eumenes. Eumenes would hurry out of Phoenicia and marched his army east in an attempt to gather support in the eastern provinces. In this, he was successful. Most of the eastern satraps joined his cause, more than doubling his army. They marched throughout Mesopotamia, Babylonia, Susiana, and Media, until the two armies eventually met. Antagonus deployed his light horse on his left under Patheon. His heavy cavalry and light infantry were placed on the right flank under his own command, and his phalanx held the center, while the war elephants were spread across the line. Eumenes also placed his phalanx in the center, with the elite hypaspis on the right of his phalanx. His left flank, resting near the hill, was made up of cavalry, elephants, and auxiliaries. The right flank was led by Eumenes himself with his heavy cavalry. The battle began with Patheon, ignoring his orders to hang back, charging Eumenes' heavy cavalry with his more numerous light cavalry. Eumenes held his own against Patheon, 
with his heavy cavalry and elephants, and then attacked him in the flank with a couple of his own light cavalry squadrons. Patheon was driven back en route. In the center, the two phalanxes engaged, again to Eumenes' advantage, due to the incredible skill of the veteran Hypaspis, who despite their age, 50 to 70 years old, seemed invincible. Antagonus's phalanx was also driven back. Despite these reverses, Antagonus kept his head, and when he observed the very success of the enemy phalanx had led them forward, opening up a gap between their center and their left flank, he charged his heavy cavalry into this gap, wheeling right and left to the rear of Eumenes' cavalry and his phalanx. The attack proved successful, ending what seemed to be the start of Eumenes' victory. The battle slowed as both sides tried to rally broken units, and both armies encamped for the night. Though Antagonus claimed victory, he lost some 3,700 men, while Eumenes came off with a loss of only 540 men. During the night, Antagonus force marched his army to get away from Eumenes, but the following year, in 315 BC, they would meet again at the Battle of Gabine. Antagonus, having a superiority in cavalry, resolved to mass his heavy cavalry and most of his elephants and light infantry on his right, with his phalanx in the center and light horse on the left. Antagonus and his son Demetrius commanded the heavy cavalry themselves. Eumenes, having seen Antagonus' deployment, placed himself and his best cavalry opposite Antagonus, along with his own elephants and light infantry. He intended to hold Antagonus's charge while using his elite Hypaspis to win in the center. The skirmishers and elephants were the first to engage. At once, a great cloud of dust was raised from the loose soil, obscuring most of the action. Antagonus observed this and decided to take advantage of it. He sent a body of light cavalry to ride around Eumenes' left flank and attack his camp. Because of the dust, this action went entirely unnoticed by Eumenes army. Finding the enemy camp inadequately guarded, Antagonus's men captured and carried off most of their opponent's baggage train, containing the wives, children, servants, and accumulated savings of the army. On the right flank, using the thick dust to cover their movements, Antagonus rode with his heavy cavalry and unexpectedly hit Eumenes' horsemen on their flank. Taken by surprise, a great part of Eumenes' heavy cavalry under Pusithis was routed. Despite Eumenes' heroic efforts to drive off the antagonists, he was seriously outnumbered and was driven back. The battle of the elephants and skirmishers was decided when Eumenes' lead elephant was killed, and the rest became so unnerved they fled. Antagonists had clearly won the battle on the right flank. Meanwhile, in the center, the two phalanxes had engaged. Spearheaded by the invincible silver shields, Eumenes' phalanx won a clear victory. Eumenes now ordered Pusitis to charge the antagonist flank and exploit the advantage. But the latter refused, retreating even further instead. Antagonus ordered his right flank to attack Eumenes' phalanx in the rear. This forced the heavy cavalry to break off their victorious pursuit, but being battle-hardened veterans, they kept their heads, formed a square, and safely marched off the battlefield. The battle's result was, like the previous, inconclusive, with Eumenes still possessing a strong force. That evening, Eumenes attempted to convince the army to fight Antagonus again the next day, but his army was reluctant as they had just found out their camp had been plundered. It was the Silver Shields who took matters into their own hands, learning that antagonists had their wives, children, servants, and booty. They secretly opened negotiations with antagonists. A deal was struck whereby antagonists would return their baggage and families in return for Eumenes and a promise of future allegiance. The Silver Shields promptly arrested Eumenes and his senior officers, 
and handed them over to Antagonus, who subsequently had him executed. With Eumenes' death, the war in the eastern part of the Empire ended. Antagonus and Cassander had won the war. Antagonus now controlled Asia Minor and the eastern provinces. Cassander Mastodon and a large part of Greece, Lysimachus Thrace, and Ptolemy Egypt, Syria, Cyrene, and Cyprus. Their enemies were either dead or seriously reduced in power and influence.